Good evening. Good evening. Share with me responsibly the call to worship. Let us worship God. God sent the Son into the world not to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through Him. God's love endures forever. God is our refuge and strength, a present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth should change, though the mountains shake in the heart of the sea, though the waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble with its tumult. God's love endures forever. Our hymn is number 320. chapter of the Gospel of John. This should be a fairly familiar story. As he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. As long as it is day, we must do the work of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Now having said this, he spit on the ground and made some mud with the saliva and put it on the man's eyes. <clears throat> Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. This word means sent. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. His neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, Isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed that he was. Others said, no, he only looks like him. But he himself insisted, I am the man. How then were your eyes open, they demanded. He replied, the man they called Jesus made some mud and put it on my eyes. He told me to go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed, and then I could see. So where is this man? They asked him, I don't know, he said. Now they brought to the Pharisees the man who had been blind. Now the day on which Jesus had made the mud and opened the man's eyes was the Sabbath. Therefore the Pharisees also asked him, 
<clears throat> excuse me, the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. Well, he put mud on my eyes, the man replied, and I washed, and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others asked, how can a sinner do such miraculous signs? So they were divided. Finally, they turned again to the blind man. What have you to say about him? It was your eyes he opened. The man replied, he is a prophet. The Jews still did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they sent for the man's parents. Is this your son, they asked? Is this the one you say was born blind? How is it that he now can see? We know he is our son, the parents answered, and we know he was born blind, but how he can see now or who opened his eyes, we don't know. Ask him. He is of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews, for already the Jews had decided that anyone who acknowledged that Jesus was the Christ would be put out of the synagogue. That is why his parents said, he is of age, ask him. A second time they summoned the man who had been blind. Give glory to God, they said. We know this man is a sinner. He replied, well, whether he is a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. Then they asked him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered, I have told you already, and you didn't listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? Then they hurled insults at him and said, You are this fellow's disciple. We are disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses, but as for this fellow, we don't even know where he comes from. The man answered, Now that is remarkable. You don't know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to the godly man who does his will. Nobody has ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind. Beloved, the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> Now, I make no promises this evening as far as whether or not the remarks will live up or down to the title of the sermon. Most of you who have a church background know how fickle a sermon title can be. Or a graduation or commencement address or anything else for that matter. But we just might sum it up by saying Two heretics went out for a walk one day. Now, they didn't know each the other being heretical, but they were soon to find out. This story of the man born blind is, to my way of thinking, it's a one-act play in six scenes, and it has a very large cast of characters. And as biblical stories go, there are at least 12 disciples, a crowd of nosy neighbors, some Pharisees, two parents, the man himself, and Jesus. Now these last two get most of the attention, as well they should, for there are the two heretics. You're probably thinking, well, heretic's a rather strong word, especially when talking about Jesus. And this poor man who was born blind, what did he ever do? Well, the story revolves around these two because they are the only so-called sinners. I call them heretics, sinners. You choose your own word. But you see, Jesus broke one of the Ten Commandments by healing this man on the Sabbath. 
and the man who was had his sight restored seemed not to be telling the truth when indeed the Pharisees and the other leaders of the temple, the faithful, were asking why this had happened. And of course, the man didn't help his cause any by swearing that apparently this man that they thought was a heretic obviously had to come from God to do what he did. So, at this point, Jesus spits in some dirt. And forgive me, I don't want to be any more graphic than that because the last time I preached on this text, there were several people who got up and left because they just could not imagine anyone holding still long enough to have someone spit in their eye, let alone mix some dirt in it and make mud. But that's what the story says. Now at this point, Jesus rubs the, man, the, rubs the mud on the man's eyes and tells him to go wash in the pool of Siloam, which he does, and then Jesus disappears for the rest of the story. When he swoops, only to be seen again when he swoops in to claim a new disciple. Doesn't that just figure for an evangelist or ministerial types? And believe me, I know that bunch. In between times, the man is on his own. He's answerable for all of this, including the works of Jesus. Now, something powerful has happened to him, that much he can say. He doesn't have a clue about how it actually worked, whether it had something to do with the cornea, the retina, or the eyelids, or the other uh, amazing parts of the human eye. But the fact is, he could see. Now, stop for a moment and think. This is a man who was born blind, has never seen anything before in his life, he has only the spoken word of his compatriots to give him some idea of what the world looks like. Now, elsewhere in the Gospels, there is a story that varies from this about one who's had sight restored and who says when his compatriots ask him, well, what do you see? Well. I don't know. It's almost as if the trees walk around and clap their hands. Well, then there was a second application, and things became clearer. Now, of course, the gospel writer doesn't bother with mere details as to how that's possible. But the grand jury, I mean the Pharisees, come to this man and we can almost imagine that is, if he is a beggar, he's probably still sitting on the ground wondering what it is this world is that has been opened up to him. And they surround him and they say, well, <laughs> it was your eyes that were open. How is this possible? And where is the man who did this? Now, this is something akin, I suppose, to a candidate for ministry who's sitting before the august presence of the Committee on Ministry of Presbytery. And one wonders if the answer I'm about to give this group is going to be the right answer, a right answer, or am I just altogether completely immature? But you see, they wanted to know. And the poor man has to have felt like a White House aide who's just received a subpoena by the grand jury and now is surrounded and hounded by every member of the press that can get to him or her. And they want to know just how and who and where and when and what and why. And they all assume that uh, perhaps this guy is mixed up in something unsavory. I mean, after all, if he's been subpoenaed, there must be guilt uh, implied there. Right? No? Well, they assume, from the tone of the text, that indeed, they are right. 
And the fact is that he can see for the first time in his life and that he knows anything at all about how the world works. And yet, they expect him to answer as though he knows all of that, and then so. Who is this guy? Where is he from? Now, it's hard to believe that in Luke's gospel, when this story is finally recorded, is written down, that there isn't at least some implication that Jesus was already known. For certainly he would have been. But for the sake of good storytelling, the Pharisees, of all people, remain ignorant, as does the man who has received the gift. I don't know his name. I don't know where he came from. I don't know if these guys who came into town with him were even his followers. All I know is that I was blind, and now I see. Gee, that sounds like a good song lyric, doesn't it? <laughs> So his answers are, at best, very timid one-liners. Now, there's an astonishing thing that happens here. And, of course, he tells them that he's as astonished as they are, if not more so. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but he does listen to one who worships him and obeys his will. Now, those are the words of the Pharisee. There again, they're trying to come around from the other side now and tell him that he's too dumb to know. And obviously, he doesn't truly really worship God if he really thinks that this man who gave him his eyesight was from God. Now, I find that interesting because it's not the first time by direction or implication that the Pharisees turn up as being the ones who are really blind in the story, even though they've had their eyesight for a great many years. But it is at this point that if they were in a room, everyone stops breathing. It gets very quiet. Because now, in the full light in front of them, sits one who at best is a heretic and at worst, is a liar. Furious new eyes, unbitten noses, and I say unbitten noses because the attitude of this man who was formerly blind is that of course he's from God. And if you would know, if you knew anything that you say you really do about being the experts on God, it would be as plain as the nose on your face and as if it were bitten. Well, no bitten noses in this crowd, but certainly a rising gorge, a rage is building in these people because they're not used to having people, good God-fearing people, let alone some crazy character who claims to be blind, sitting in the dust, begging and not going out and getting a job. And they're not used to such people telling them their business. Of course, now that I think about it, most ministers, including this one, don't like it when people tell them their business. But, you know, some of my greatest discoveries or revelations in ministry have come from y'all. So, do you believe in the Son of Man? Well, yes, of course. Well, you can't possibly believe in the Son of Man because the Son of Man was be, would be none other than the Messiah. And this man, whoever he is, who's disappeared now, uh, is not the Messiah. The Messiah is not yet here. Well, from where I sit and what I see, it sure looks like it. And I think we can read that little bit of sarcasm into this poor man's words. So who is he? The man says, well, you know, I wish I knew and I wish you would tell me so that I could go and thank him. Because up to this point, there hasn't been any thanks given for what obviously has been a great gift. So he says, tell me so that I may believe in him, that I may thank him. Well, 
if you read ministries or mysteries, then you know what happens next. There they are with just 10 pages to go in the text and you don't have a clue and you have all the clues you're ever going to get but still you don't know who it is that done it. And then comes the moment of revelation, just the sound of a familiar voice, maybe asking the one question that makes sense of all the others. Who did it? Well, it was this one right here. And usually it's the most obvious one. Now I say that because my mother learned early on in raising me that she had at least one child who if you put anything you wanted to keep hidden from him right out in front of God and everybody where he could stumble over it, never know it. But try and hide it under a bed or in the back of a closet and David would be in it in a sh like a shot. So, it's kind of hard to imagine the confession of this man and that it doesn't take place in the synagogue or before an altar or at least with a Bible or a book, the Torah, for the man to put his hand on and swear. But you know what their response finally is? And this is a classic, and I'm not just saying this. Uh, for uh, our Roman Catholic sisters and brothers, but for Protestants as well. The first thing they act to do, rather than keep him around and try to figure this thing out, they excommunicate him. They throw him out of the church. And of course his parents have been hanging at the back of the crowd. They now exit stage left because if he gets thrown out, so do they. Well, we have a very courageous group here, don't we? And yet, here we are reading it in church all these centuries later, claiming it as a story about us, which means, I suppose, that we imagine ourselves in the role of the blind man or the man born blind. The only problem is that reading, it, with this reading, as far as I can tell, is that we still have to decide who the Pharisees are. And I'm here to tell you that the longer I live, the more I have in common with the Pharisees. Not to mention the fact that I am from Missouri. Now I know for some of you it's Missouri. If you're from St. Louis, Kansas City, yes, it's Missouri. The rest of us in the Ozarks, it was Missouri. So I'm from Missouri. The longer I live, the more you have to show me. So here's the poor man, and he's sitting and he's giving them as good as they gave him. And finally, according to John, these are the people to watch out for because they think that they can see. <laughs> yes, get out of the way for those of us who can really see. We are the guardians of the faith, would be their mantra. So, this man at best could be a prophet and a false one at that. Not fully initiated, law-abiding, pledge-paying, creed-saying, theologically correct people who could spot a heretic from a mile away. Well, according to John, these are the people to watch out for because they think they can see. And yet what the story comes down to is that this man holds out long enough and when Jesus indeed returns to the center of the stage, he indeed claims a new follower who immediately knows that there's something familiar about this stranger of course, he's never seen him, has he? No. Remember, he was the mud with one with mud in his eye, and I don't mean that in the crude sense of the local bar room, or so I've heard. <laughs> but you see, the man who was born blind 
thinks there's something familiar about that voice. And finally, he asks Jesus, are you the one who did this? Now, of course, he could ask it with great annoyance. Are you the one who did this? Do you know what a headache this has been? No, are you the one who did this? There's somebody to be thanked, and I want to know, are you the one who did this? And we're told quite simply in the gospel that he does indeed recognize him without being told. But finally Jesus says, yes, I am the one. Well, in that case, you are the son of man. Which in John's gospel is how Jesus seems to want to be referred. Uh, it's a little less dangerous than coming right out and saying, well, I'm the Messiah. But, or well, if that's not God, I don't know what is. So, the question is answered for the important ones in this story, and that is for Jesus and for the blind beggar, blind from birth. I don't know whether he was a sinner, but one thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. We should be so blessed as this man. Our hymn is numbered 240. And I see we should have sung it before the meditation. <laughs> so um, I won't go through the meditation again, I promise. <laughs>
Let us lift the words of our responsive litany. Accomplish in us, O God, Lord, the work of your, your salvation, salvation, that we may show forth your glory in the world. By the cross and passion of our Savior, pleading us with all your saints to the joy of Christ's resurrection. Let us look for our God throughout the season of fasting. Amen. Amen. Friends, we do not have a great deal of time with those that we journey on this earth. So I would commend to you that let us respond to everyone with loving kindness and be quick to gladden the hearts of those with whom we travel. And as we do, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you. May the Lord lift up the light of his holy countenance upon you and give you his peace now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Amen.